So it's Feb 1. We're in uh, Chapter 8 dealing with vapor power cycles. Next time, the intention is to hand out a take-home exam. We move quickly, don't we, when we have uh, an exam per chapter. Uh, please um, note that this handout will be on Tuesday, meaning you only have till Thursday to really look it over and develop any questions about it. You don't have the whole weekend. So let's uh, continue on then. So we've covered a lot of ground in this chapter, but we're down here in what we call uh, regeneration, where we're trying to get the uh, feed water into the steam generator, or I also call it the boiler, uh, at higher temperature. And uh, last time we talked about the open feed water heater. This time we'll talk about a closed feed water heater. Both of these are heaters. They're just heat exchangers. We've analyzed heat exchangers in Thermo 1. They're just heat exchangers, so let's jump into it. Uh, next time we'll talk about turbine efficiencies and pump efficiencies. But at, at this point, all of our efficiencies have, have been 100%. So they've been uh, reversible and adiabatic. So isentropic uh, flow through the turbines and uh, isentropic flow through the pumps. Okay, so the goal is to get this fluid going into the steam generator warmer, hot, had a higher temperature. If you just took the fluid out of the pump, and if we've kicked around some numbers before, it could be as cold as 60 degrees C. So maybe we can get that up, 100, maybe 100 and a half. That's going to help us in performance. So what did the engineers come up with? They come up with a device that you can put right in here that I've covered up that will take some steam right here and uh, achieve the goal of getting the feed water to a higher temperature. But here they don't have it where it just mixes. They have a closed feed water heater, meaning there's a fluid stream that's the hot fluid stream, I'll draw it in red, that continues through this heat exchanger, and then a colder fluid stream, which is now gaining heat, so it goes in maybe 60, it comes out, you know, the higher temperature at state 7. That's why it's a colder fluid stream. That's the direction of heat transfer from the hot fluid stream to the cold fluid stream. Well, it's, it's, it has an in and an out too. So there's two ins and two outs. Okay, well, once you come out with some fluid here, you're going to have to do something with it. You're going to have to get it back into the cycle. You just don't lose it to the environment. So they pass it through what is called a steam trap and then dump it into the condenser. So what does this closed feed water heater look like? A little close, closer. It's basically what we call a shell and tube. It can be a different type of heat exchanger, but a shell and tube heat exchanger makes sense. So on the shell side, you have steam coming in, and it could be two-phase with high-quality uh, liquid vapor mixture, or it could be saturated vapor, or it could be slightly superheated vapor. But the idea is to have a lot of vapor coming in that hot stream. Okay. On the shell side going out, you have condensate going out. So you can think of it, um, what would happen if I had steam, the vapor, in contact with colder tubes? Well, it would condense on the tubes, drip off the tubes, and the condensate would collect in the bottom. And as it uh, con condensed on the tubes, it would have a good heat transfer into the colder fluid in the tubes. It would heat the fluid in the tubes. So that's what's happening. So once the condensate's collected, you want to put it somewhere. And so you, you put it through a steam trap. This looks like a expansion valve or a, just a pressure drop across a valve. That's exactly what it is, but it's controlled. Yes? Yes, that's kind of uh, showing a tube. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so this would be the tube side, so the fluid would go here. There would be multiple tubes. This is just an illustration. Bunch of tubes inside a shell. So this steam trap has a funny name. I mean, it's like, what is it doing? What's it trapping? Is it collecting something? It's holding back the vapor. And when there's enough condensate built up, it opens and allows condensate to go out, but not so much to, that it would drain all the condensate and then some vapor would start to go out. No, no, no. 
it would actually shut down then. And so the way this typically works is it's intermittent. It opens a little bit and then closes. Opens a little bit and then closes. You can think of it having a, a little uh, float valve up here. And then it, as that float gets higher, it would open it up. And as the float is lower because the condensate level falls, it would close. They don't all work that way. There's a number of ways steam traps work, and they're very interesting. And if you get in this field, you'll have to maybe know that about how they actually work. You can go on the Internet and look at many YouTube videos on how these steam traps work. There's multiple designs. But the idea is it holds back the vapor only letting condensate through, only condensate. So the condensate collects enough there, then it goes through. So what about the pressure on the inlet to the outlet of the steam trap? It's just like a restriction. And so it's going to have a high pressure on one side and a low pressure on the other side. It's going to drop the pressure. Okay. Now, once you pass through, this a colder fluid in the tubes is going to be heated because essentially the condensing of the steam on the outside, and it's going to come out warmer at state seven. That's essentially it. Is this the only way that the engineers designed to integrate a closed feed water heater into the plant? No. Here, let's take a look at another design or another way. You could basically not send the liquid back to the condenser. You could do something else with the liquid. Well, that's probably not too hard for you to decide. You say saturate liquid, probably put it into a pump. Instead of dropping the pressure in a steam trap, I could boost the pressure. Now that I boosted the pressure, I need to put it back into my cycle somewhere. So you just collect the liquid, saturate liquid, through it, put it through a pump, and then actually mix it with the fluid that's coming into the steam generator. That's another design. So this, this device right here is the same. It's a closed feed water heater. It's just what do you do with the condensate on the outlet? Do you put it through a trap? or do you put it into a pump? Do you drop the pressure and then stuff it into maybe a condenser or somewhere else in the cycle? Or do you put it through a pump and then push it into a higher pressure location in the cycle? All right. Let's ask some questions. I have this heat exchanger. Forget about what the condensate does. Don't focus on that. We just know that saturated liquid's gonna come out of this stream at the bottom, okay? And that's the hot stream, isn't it? Isn't that the fluid that's providing heat and warming the other fluid? This is the cold stream flowing this way. And the goal is to get the temperature <coughs> of seven up. That's what we want, high outlet for that condensate or the liquid uh, coming through on the tube side. We want the temperature at seven to be as high as possible because that's about ready to go into our steam generator. Okay, the question is, is can the temperature at seven be greater than the temperature at two? What's the temperature at two right here? I'm gonna pause maybe and walk around and collect a few answers as you study this problem. So some of you already answered it, so that's great. So the consensus is, is that T7 needs to be less than T2. That's good. You know what? You can, on a paper, you can have a heat exchanger, and it can conserve energy, but it can also violate the second law of thermodynamics. And as soon as you might, on paper, have conservation of energy, and then maybe you have T7 greater than T2, guess what you're going to show you, if you did a second law analysis? You could show that it would violate the second law. It would be impossible. Hey, thermodynamics is useful. <laughs> it's useful. So basically, it's from a second law. Your intuition is typically correct. It's just a heat exchanger. The heat is always transferred from something hot to something cold, period. It doesn't, when you put two things in contact, this goes back to thermo one. I put something in hot in contact with something that's cold. Can the hot ever just spontaneously get hotter and the cold get colder? Violation of the second law. So good. Let's press forward. 
So how about for this heat exchanger where you're coming and mixing? Could T7 ever be greater than T2? See, what we're doing is we're, we're changing what happens to the outlet of that heat exchanger. Professor, you just asked the same question, didn't you? Uh, you yeah, I know, but sometimes you think, you get confused. You say, well, something's different happening here. Maybe T7 now can be greater than T2. No, 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 no. Focus on the heat exchanger. All right, let's keep on. Now let's talk about this steam trap. It's been a while, maybe since we analyzed devices which really are pressure-changing devices. Uh, is, isn't that what a valve is? Uh, don't I have a high pressure on one side, low pressure on the other side? So this is focusing on this steam trap and focusing on state 8 and state 9. I'd like to make a list of all the properties that we could talk about. Let's talk about the pressure. Let's talk about temperature. Let's talk about specific volume, internal energy, enthalpy, entropy, and flow exergy. That's a pretty good list of properties in thermodynamics. And let's talk about the property of the inlet state and the outlet state to that steam trap. Uh, is P8 equal to P9? True or false? False. Okay, if it's that's not true, then which way is it? Is P8 greater than P9? Yeah, don't 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 lose sight of the obvious, right? High pressure on the inlet, low pressure on the outlet. If we if we drop the ball on that one, if we stumble on that one, the rest of this discussion is going to be very difficult. <laughs> Okay, it's high pressure on the inlet, low pressure on the outlet. It's basically a restriction, flow through a restriction. Okay, uh, let's see. Maybe we want to avoid talking about temperature. Maybe we want to avoid this one. I don't know. Which one do you think you have the next best shot of answering on? Okay, let's focus on enthalpy. H, the property H. Why did somebody say, I think I can make an observation about enthalpy? Because they've taken and done a control volume around this, and they didn't do a mass balance. They did a first law analysis, an energy balance for that control volume. And then, in the style of Dr. Creamy, we're going to say, oh, the rate of change of energy in that control volume with respect to time equal to the rate of pause in minus the shaft work out plus the mass flow rate in and it's going to be inlet is equal to outlet so we'll have enthalpy coming in let's call that state eight enthalpy going out state nine then we'll have the kinetic energy in at state eight minus kinetic energy out of state nine plus the potential energy in at state eight minus potential energy out of state nine did i do a pretty good job of writing down the most general and then what we say is why is that term zero state why is Q dot equal to zero? No heat transfer with the surroundings. No shaft work in or out of this device. That's our standard assumptions. And why do we neglect changes in kinetic and potential energy? Because they typically are negligible. And so when it all boils down to, somebody was right. I heard it. They said, ah, I know what I'm telling you. That is true. And if you've never taken thermodynamics before, you would say, I am lost. I'm completely, but now the, this is like natural. This is easy. Sure, it's, this is isenthalpic. The process is not isobaric, that's constant pressure. Not isothermal, that's constant temperature. Not isentropic, that's constant entropy. It's isenthalpic, it's constant enthalpy. Have we gone a long way in thermodynamics? Yeah, we have. So it's this. So now, hmm, maybe I can come and attack a few of these. Give me the next one that you think. How I'll take a volunteer. Raise your hand, catch my attention, and say, I think I can make an observation about, oh, V or T or U or S or, or flow exergy. Yes. The V, the specific volume you want to talk about? All right. So which way do you think it is for the specific volume? Okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put the specific volume on hold for a minute. This is definitely not true. V8 is different than V9 in most, most, most cases, especially when what are we bringing into state 8? Saturated liquid. That's going to be key to observing that. But let's put specific volume on hold. Which one would you like to make an observation about? 
All right, <clears throat> you want to talk about use. We got some people that really want to challenge us and talk about the hard stuff. How about back here? Uh, Which one? Okay, you know what? There's only two left, and I want to talk about either S, <laughs> either S or T. I only want to, I want to talk about S or T. So I'd like one more volunteer. Yes. He would like to talk about S. Let's talk about entropy. Why? Because we can write the general second law analysis for the same control volume. Let me write it down. The rate of change of entropy in the control volume respect to time is equal to. It can flow in with heat. True. You put it over some boundary temperature. That's the way it flows in with heat. True or false? I know we could write it as an integral, but let's not get complicated. And then we're going to have the mass flow rate bringing with it entropy 8, taking with it entropy 9. And there's one other term. Entropy, did I do a good job? And then we're going to say steady state. Adiabatic, S8 is equal to S9 plus sigma dot divided by m dot. Hold it, I messed that up. It's the other way around. S9 is equal to S8 plus sigma dot over m dot. Is that true? I have to make an observation about sigma dot. I forgot, what does that term sigma dot mean? What's it for? It's entropy generation. I have to look at this problem and I have to make an observation. Is sigma dot equal to zero or not? I'm going to pause, walk around. I want you to tell me. As I walk around, is sigma dot less than zero, equal to zero, or greater than zero for this problem? Somebody learned the second law. I heard that already. So uh, back to Thermo 1, what were the sources of irreversibility when we were introduced to the concept of irreversibility, I think, in Chapter 5? Did, there's no shame in going back and reviewing previous chapter, right? So maybe you want to go back and look at Chapter 5. I think that's where they talk about source of irreversibility, when sigma dot would be non-zero. And they said friction. They said heat transfer through a finite temperature difference, flow through a finite pressure drop, or mixing too perfectly pure like oxygen, carbon dioxide. Just let them mix. No chemical reaction. It's going to be really hard to undo that to make it reversible once they're mixed up. And then another one is uh, some sort of chemical reactions. We'll get to that. Agree? Do you remember that? So basically, you think about the valve is full of friction or its flow through a finite pressure difference. Once it's dropped to that low pressure, just think of it as an engineer. Say, oh, I made a mistake. I'm sorry, Steam. Now that you're low pressure, I want you just spontaneously go back to high pressure. Ain't going to happen, right? Right? It's just it's, so it's highly irreversible. So sigma dot is greater than zero. Hence, the exit entropy S8 is not equal to S, uh, S9 is not equal to S8. S9 is greater than S8. It's not reversible. It's not isentropic. It's irreversible. There is some higher entropy going out. Once you have that, it really is going to be more helpful if we take a look at and finish these off on a diagram. On a diagram, okay? Uh, my favorite diagram this today is the temperature entropy diagram. So we're going to put like this, and we're going to put a line of high pressure. That line of high pressure is P8. And then we're going to put a line of lower pressure. That less pressure is P9. And then we're going to find out what is it going into that valve, where we're going into that restriction. Where are we going into that restriction? Put a dot on the diagram, saturated liquid at the high pressure. Ha ha, now I can see if it would be somehow perfectly reversible, then it would be straight up and down on the entropy, but that's not the case. We just talked about that, didn't we? So it's got to end up on that lower pressure line and it's got to be to the right of where S8 is. S9 has to be greater. So we kick it out a little bit where are we at? 
compressed liquid, superheated vapor, two-phase liquid vapor mixture. Where are we at in the dome? Yeah, two-phase liquid vapor mixture. Aren't we? And so the, the, the process looks like that. A dashed line instead of a solid line, we use dashed lines on diagrams like this to indicate it's an irreversible process. Solid, solid lines to indicate it's a reversible process. And now it's like, oh, look at that. The quality at state 9 is, oh, I don't know, maybe 15%, 20%. You know what I mean? Some of it's vapor. Actually, some of it, quote, unquote, flashes. This is going to be revisited when we get to refrigeration because this is key in refrigeration systems. Putting high-pressure liquid through an expansion valve, and then what comes out the other end when it's low pressure? A two-phase mixture at low temperature. Look at the temperature. Look at the temperature change. Hey, that, ans that answers this question, doesn't it? How is T8 and T9? T8's greater, T9's lower. You had to have heat transfer, Professor. You can't fool me. The substance goes into a device, it comes out colder. It must have a lot of heat transfer out of the device. Is there any heat transfer out of this valve? No. How did the temperature change? I just don't believe thermodynamics. Well, enjoy refrigeration and air conditioning, but that's the way it works, right? This, this is real. This is works. Yeah, T9 is lower than T8 without any heat transfer, just a pressure drop. Saturated liquid in there. Okay, and then basically you could figure out these. It's going to expand. It's going to take more room. The specific volume of state 9 is going to be larger. What about the internal energy? This one's probably the hardest. All right, so what is the H? It's U8 uh, plus um, P8V8 equal to U9 plus P9V9. That's true. H8 is equal to H9. What is H? U, U plus PV. U plus PV. So what you got to do is you got to basically say, how does this U8 and U9 compare? <laughs> and uh, the, it's going to impact with the pressure and specific volume. The pressure in, in the specific volume, because the sp specific volume is so much larger at 9, I think that's going to outweigh this one. And so... U9 is going to be uh, lower. U is primarily whatever. You could look that up and check it. But you know what? This is really not needed. These here are needed. This one's desperately needed. That one's definitely needed. That one, you know, knowing what happens to the pressure, what happens to the temperature, what happens to the enthalpy, what happens to the entropy. Those are all high priority. How about the flow exergy? We can make that observation with confidence. You think you're better able to make work now out of the fluid stream since it's at state 9, or do you think it would have been easier to make some work out of it at state 8? State 9 has been some destroy. that You had exergy, I mean entropy production. You multiply that by the dead state temperature. You have some destruction of exergy. And so the EF9 is lower, lower than EF8. It didn't help. The flow exergy went down. All right, that's a great discussion. I think that was your question about steam traps, and so hopefully that helped. This is not eat trivial. This is, you know, this is part of the core of the class. Uh, this is, hopefully you walk away with being able to understand all of that. Now, once we have uh, our system and uh, we can theoretically uh, think about splitting off some flow and feeding it down to this closed feed water heater, we have to come up with an equation for how much should be diverted. What's the magnitude of Y? We did this before for the other feed water heater, didn't we? Uh, somebody says, since we already have the equation for Y, the mass fraction diverted down to, can't, can't we use that previous equation? It's a different setup. You can't. You, you're, unfortunately, you're going to have to look at every system and then work it out. What is this fraction Y? 
Okay, well, this begs the question then, how do I work it out? You're going to do, for the control volume analysis around there, you're going to do a mass balance and an energy balance. Conservation of energy, conservation of mass. The mass balances I worked out last time for the whole plant. Let's just do that, and hopefully you've, got, you've gotten better at it. But Y is the fraction that's diverted down. Remember the equation for Y would be like the mass flow rate down to feed the closed, uh, the, or just call it the closed feed water heater, divided by the mass flow rate that went through the first turbine stage. That's really what we're looking for, Y. And then what happens is we have 1 minus Y continues the journey. There was a split. So if, 20, if Y is 20%, then 80%, 1 minus Y, continues on. It goes back to the reheat. And then it's 1 minus y, that fraction that goes through the second turbine. 1 minus y is that fraction that goes through the condenser. But look at here. You had y coming through. You go through the shell side of that closed feed water heater. You, you have y as the mass fraction going through the steam trap. And then after the steam trap, it's dumped into the condenser for this problem. So I have a fluid stream bringing y amount in. in 1 minus y in, what's going to come out at 5 ready to go into the pump? 1. You're back to 100%. Then at 1 through the pump, 1 at state 7, 1 inlet to the steam generator, 1 outlet to the steam generator, 1 outlet through the first turbine stage. So I have to get that basically is my mass balance. So now I use it with my energy balance. I know that you're getting better at these energy balances, but let me just write it like that. I'm going to say my enthalpy 2 coming in with its mass flow rate divided by the mass flow rate through the first turbine, so I'm going to turn it into a Y, plus the enthalpy in at 6 times 100%, minus or is equal to, or whatever you want to do, is equal to the H8 taking out Y, and the H7 taking out 100%. That may not look like, I maybe I need more room, but, but let me challenge you. We did this more detail slower last time on the energy and mass balance. and we So this equation, one equation, one unknown, you could solve for Y. It's in terms of those enthalpies. Wouldn't it be something like um, H6 minus H8 divided by? None, that's not right. It's uh, H2 minus H8, right? Uh, that's man, I got to divide by that. H2 minus H8, right? Finally, it gets something right. And then H7 minus H6. It's algebra. Well, there you go. Did I get it right? 7 minus 6, yeah. 2 minus 8, yeah. Well, <coughs> We come over here, and, and here we had a steam trap. Here we had a pump to handle the condensate. Uh, we need to know what Y is for the problem here. Well, I got this equation. Maybe it's the same equation. Do you think it's the same equation for Y? No, life would be too easy. You're going to need to get another equation, different equation for Y, for a different setup of your power plant. So first things first, let's track our mass flow rates. This is Y coming down, Y goes through the pump, Y goes into the mix. Okay, what comes out? 100%, 100% goes through the steam generator, 100% goes to the first turbine, 100% comes out of the first turbine stage, and then it splits and Y goes down, so that 1 minus Y goes up, 1 minus Y goes to reheat, 1 minus Y goes to the second turbine, 1 minus Y goes to the condenser, 1 minus Y goes to the first pump, 1 minus Y out of the first pump and into the tubes of the closed feed water heater, and 1 minus Y out of the tubes of the closed feed water heater. Did I do the mass balance correct? Got to get that right. And now we can write it for an energy balance for the, the closed feed water heater. You're going to have uh, H2 times Y minus H8 times Y equal, well, just put it plus, H6 times 1 minus Y minus H7 times 1 minus Y equal to 0. All right.
So you clean that up and you get an equation for why it's not the same equation as the previous. So every power plant, you're going to have to get your uh, mass fractions uh, correct. Okay. Let's uh, press forward. A long problem. Hopefully we have enough time to bite into this and solve it. So we have working water is the working fluid in a regenerative vapor power cycle. Superheated vapor enters the first turbine. Maybe you'd start saying, oh, I have the first turbine. That's great. Pressure and temperature, they look reasonable. We've done that before. And then it exits at 2 megapascal. Hey, that's a pretty high exit pressure, exiting at 2 megapascal. Some steam is extracted for a closed feed water heater. Oh, that's why it's regenerative. I have a feed water heater. While the rest is reheated back to 360, not all the way to 440, but it's reheated at 2 megapascal up to 360. Steam exits, hey, I have a second turbine now, but it exits at 300 kilopascal. That seems pretty high. It's not going to go to a condenser, not at 300 kilopascal. Some steam is extracted for, what? I have a closed feed water heater and I have an open feed water heater in one power plant? Yep. Okay. While the rest is reheated, I have another reheat. Yep. Two reheats back to 320 and then expands to a third turbine. So we have a first turbine, second turbine, third turbine. Saturated liquid leaves the condenser at 20 kilopascal. So it looks like after the third turbine, it goes to the condenser and then it leaves. Condensate from the closed feed water heater is passed through a steam trap and into the open feed water heater. And then compressed liquid at this pressure temperature leaves the closed feed water heater. And then just get the back work ratio and the thermal efficiency. No sweat. No sweat. I get that in one line, a couple minutes. No, this is a big problem. Big, big, big problem, right? So what did I recommend? What, what sort of things should we do when we're... Get a diagram. Uh, the schematic of all the components. Where's the first turbine? Where's the second turbine? Where's the third turbine? Where's the condenser? Where's the pumps? How many pumps? Where are the feed water heaters? And then all the pipes connecting them. Where does it go? Where does the fluid go? And then where are the states? The states are the conditions of the steam about ready to enter this component or exit that component or enter here or exit there. Get all your states. Can I give you a few minutes? You better get three turbines down first. Three turbines, a condenser, steam generator, and leave plenty of room for piping. Because you got to go back to that steam generator for two reheats. Two reheats. All right, I'm going to give you a few minutes to work on it. Yes, I have a handout. That's what you want. You want this handout. But this is candy. This is not trick or treat. Um, you, well, not really. Let me do this. I'm uh, sorry, in the interest of time, I wish I could give you so everybody could come up with a diagram from words. And I encourage you to do that. Test yourself, okay? But in the interest of time, sorry, I'm going to shortchange your education. So here is basically the layout. Do we have the turbine one, turbine two, turbine three, and then the condenser? This is where it gets a little challenging, true? We know that we have one pump after the condenser. That's for sure. Okay, that helps. We know that we're diverting some down to this closed feed water heater. And then if you read the problem, it says something about it's trapped. And then what does the condensate do that it goes through the steam trap? It goes into the open feed water heater. So you could have trapped it down to the condenser or you could have trapped it down to the open feed water heater. That's a little challenging right there to get that plumbing figured out. And then the open feed water heater has a traditional diversion from after the second turbine. It has the pump after the first pump coming through the condenser. And then what comes out of that steam trap dumped into it too. Ah, this is a little different. Hey, I've not seen an uh, open feed water heater with three inputs. But for this problem, we have three inputs. And then we have one output, and it goes into a pump. And then it goes up and through. Hey, is there another pump over here? Not really needed. 
because it's just being heated as it goes through. There's no pressure drop. You can bump, pump it up all the way to the high pressure. Now, I have a mass fraction Y1 or Y prime, and then a mass fraction Y2 or Y double prime, depending on what book you look at, the syntax. Okay? And I need to be able to figure those out. And so I'm going to come down here, do a control volume around that device, the closed feed water heater, do a mass balance and an energy balance, and I'll get an equation for Y prime. Here is my equation for Y prime. It's in terms of enthalpies. I'm going to spend more time on it, but I'm telling you I need to get that equation. It has to be correct. The next equation, I need to get an equation for Y double prime. I'm going to come down here. I'm going to do an energy and mass balance for the open feed water heater. I'm going to be able to get, in, especially from the energy balance, an equation for Y double prime. How much is diverted? Maybe 8% is diverted to feed that one, and maybe 11% is diverted to feed that other one. But I need to calculate those, those, those primes, those Y prime and um, double prime. Okay, so now that you know the answer and where we're going, how do I do the mass balance efficiently? The way I recommended before, go ahead and track everything. So if I have 100% coming out of the steam generator into the first turbine, 100% comes out of the first turbine, but then some is diverted, Y prime is diverted. What continues back to the first reheat? 1 minus Y prime. What comes into 1 minus Y prime? Into the second turbine. 1 minus y prime. But then 1 minus y prime comes out of it, but then y double prime, another fraction, a different percent, is siphoned off. So guess what goes back for the second reheat? 1 minus y prime minus y double prime. So of the 100% that went in and through the first turbine, if this is 8%, then 92 continued. And then if this was, what, 11%, then 81 continued, if I did the math correct, right? Right? And then 81% continues on. 1 minus y prime minus y double prime. Then 1 minus y prime minus y double prime. That goes through the first pump. What comes out of the first pump? 1 minus y prime minus y double prime. Okay, then it's joined up with this y double prime coming from the top. And then what's coming from the bottom? We'll just follow this one through. This is Y prime through the trap, Y prime. It joins into the open feed water heater from the bottom. So what goes out at 9? One. 1. You're back at 100%. What goes out at 10? 100%. What goes through at 11? 100%. Through the steam generator? 100%. And it makes sense. We got our mass balances correct. Right? Okay. Then let's do the energy balance for the closed feed water heater okay we're going to have the enthalpy coming in that state two coming in at that mass flow rate with the mass fraction using that mass fraction y prime we'll have the h maybe do a little more efficiently it's going to be um, h2 y prime minus H 12 Y prime both of those this is an in this is an out and then I'm going to have an in with the H 10 times 100 percent minus an H 11 at a hundred percent equal to zero so Y prime isn't too hard it'll be H 11 minus H 10 divided by H 2 minus H 12 did I do that right do I agree with myself? Thumbs up? Look okay? Hey, I've had plenty of errors. You need to check me. Is it okay? I don't have enough thumbs up. <laughs> okay, very good. So now we can do the energy balance for the open bead water heater. We already did the mass balances. So what, what's coming in? I'm going to have uh, H4 times Y double prime plus an N of 1 minus Y prime minus Y double prime times H8 plus an N of 
H13 times uh, uh, Y prime uh, minus uh, H9 times 1, that's all equal to 0. Hopefully that equation makes sense. Uh, only, it's like this equation allowed us to calculate Y prime. So I treat Y prime as already calculated in the second equation. And I just need to solve for Y double prime. And it's right there and right there. So the, the Y double prime equation is a little easier. It'll be, let me group, do it in two lines. H4 minus H8 times Y double prime equal to, and then I'm going to put H8 times 1 minus Y prime plus H13 times Y prime. That's a minus. Um, forget it. I'm, I'm going to leave it as plus and plus. I'll do that in a couple steps. And then uh, minus um, H9 equal to 0. Does that look okay? And then Y double prime is equal to H9 minus H13 Y prime minus H8 1 minus Y prime divided by H4 minus H8. Hopefully I got the same equation. All right, a lot of work. <laughs> oh, professor, can we start solving this problem? Okay, I'm trying, I'm trying. Let's move on. So we have these equations. So property diagram, you got to put it on a property diagram. Maybe you work on the handout that I gave you. Maybe you work with some of the pressure information as well as the property diagram in the schematic kind of going in all three, okay? Parts of the property table may help you as you work with the TS diagram, but I need to get all the states on the TS diagram. It'll really help me. All right? Should I pause, give you some time? Did you get one? All right, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pick it up here. Um, so, one thing I don't think I emphasized enough is what about the pressure drops about this closed feed water heater? Well, I tried to say that the shell, si the shell side is the hot side where the steam is condensing. And the pressure at 2, which is the inlet there, and the pressure at 12, can you make an observation about the shell side pressure? It stays the same. It stays the same. Okay, well, does that mean the pressure 12 is the same as the pressure at 11? No, that's inside the tubes. And so the tubes have the same pressure. Pressure 11 is equal to the pressure at 10. That's why you have a closed feed water heater. They don't all have to be the same pressure. The pressure in the tubes here is very high. The pressure in the tube for this problem is 8 megapascal, isn't it? And on the shell, what is that pressure? 2 megapascal. See? So, so it's a lower pressure on the shell side than in the tubes. The tube is higher pressure. But I forgot to emphasize P2 and P12 are the same, just like P10 and P11 are the same. All right, let's press on. So what I need to do is a lot of you were able to go out here and say, I have this high pressure. I have to put my glasses on. I have this high pressure, 8 megapascal, and I'm coming out at 440, so it's right there for state 1. Very good. But then we pass it through to 2 megapascal right here. And those that did it very accurately probably did not go into the dome. It's slightly superheated at state 2. It is slightly superheated at state two. If you did it with a ruler, you can see that. But we don't heat it back up to 440. We heat it back up to 360. So it's heated up to about right here for state three, isn't it? And then we pass it through to get to 300 kilopascal. There's not a line for 300 kilopascal, so you kind of approximate it. But that's a line of 300 kilopascal. And then we pass it through. 
is some people were doing a pretty good job and the numbers are going to show that it's pretty close to being perfectly to four significant digits saturated vapor at state four. It just worked it out. That's the way the numbers work out. Now we're at 300 kilopascal and we go up and heat to five. That's after our reheat and it comes out at 320. So it comes out right about there at state five. A lower temperature, 320 versus uh, 360 versus 440. These numbers were picked because they're on their num their lines in our tables. You can don't have to do a lot of interpolation. All right, then we uh, expand down, and you'll get to 20 kilopascal this line, and we get to state six. Then we come over, condense it ready to go into the pump at state seven. State eight is right after the pump and it's right on top of state seven. Okay, so two, two dots right there for seven and eight. Now, uh, this is a little challenging here. I gotta figure out maybe uh, where state nine is. What's state nine? It's saturated liquid because it's going into my pump at uh, what pressure 300 so it's right there that's where 9 is yeah and then where's 10 right after the pump well, skosh above it but what's the pressure at 10 the pressure at 10 is already at 8 megapascal okay so that's where 9 and 10 are all right so we're at about 11. Well, that was our 8 megapascal at, at a given temperature. It leaves at 205. So right here is around 205. So right there, excuse me, right there is state uh, 11. It's 8 megapascal. 205 degrees C. All right. Uh, I need state 12 and state 13. So where is state 12? Yeah, it's a lot. It's very close to state 11, isn't it? State 12 is a saturated um, liquid, and it's the saturation temperature at the 2 megapascal is not 205. The saturation temperature is 212 degrees C. That's Tsat at 2 megapascal. So the, if you want to try and draw it accurate, it's just a little higher in temperature. Right on the dome, that's where state 12 is, right there. Saturated liquid at the 2 megapascal and 212 degrees C. All right, that's that state 12. Last one, state 13. We put it through the trap. We talked about that. Highly irreversible. You're dropping the pressure, not down to 20 kilopascal. You're dropping it to 300 kilopascal. So you're dropping it from state 12 right there. Kicks it over, dash line, over to state 13. Wow, that was a lot of work, was it not? Do, uh, do you feel like I robbed you of your education, or is that okay? Sorry. We ready to show numbers? I'm sorry? Uh, well, 11 is at the 8 meg, and it goes up to this point, which is... Uh, 14, it's saturated liquid, and then it's saturated vapor, it's 0.15, and then up to 1. So it's already on a line that connects 14, 15, and 1. It's at that 8 megapascal. I probably should have shown it closer, a little lower. It looks like I, I put 205, a little too high a temperature. Sorry about that. Maybe should, because it needs to be below 212, which is a saturation temperature at this uh, 2 megapascal. Well, once you have that, basically, you jump to 
the property table. The pressures, a lot of you were working on it. Those are usually the easiest ones. And then you toggle between entropy and enthalpy and entropy and enthalpy, blah, blah, blah. Some are saturated liquids. They help you. Some are saturated vapors. Um, but you have to work through this table. I don't have time to go through it as if you've never done that, right? But you have to. You have to do that. And then once I have all these enthalpies, then I can finally calculate the Y1 and the Y2. And for this problem, about 15% goes down to the closed feed water heater. And then about 8% is what's fed to the open feed water heater. Those are my two uh, uh, mass fractions, the Ys. Finally, I can get a table of my energy transfers. I like to put these asterisk columns so that it's now per kilogram of steam entering the first turbine stage. You really need to do this on your own, too. So this is per kilogram of what goes through each component, and then we normalize it to per kilogram that went through the first turbine stage. Some of these are the same numbers. Some of them are different because not everything went back to reheat. Maybe 1 minus y prime or 1 minus y prime minus y double prime went back to reheat. Okay, then I can check the sum, the Q net on the same mass basis, and the work net on the same mass basis must equal, otherwise I have an error, look for it. And then I can calculate the two answers that I wanted to get. What was the back work ratio? Very low, less than 1%. And the thermal efficiency, it's not over 40%, but it's nudged up a little bit. It's pretty good, 39% for a plant thermal efficiency. Let me pause. Was that a lot? Did you do okay? We're out of time. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be here if you have any other questions.